Good. Okay, we'll make sure you refer to these because they'll be on tape. Okay, we're going into the presidency of John F. Kennedy, the third part, which is civil rights, important part. And John Kennedy had a lot of good plans for civil rights during his presidency. And unfortunately, his assassination left us some open holes. But, this is a little ahead of the game, but Lyndon Johnson, who succeeded President Kennedy to the presidency, was a huge civil rights advocate as well. So plans that Kennedy made during his short time in office before assassination were carried through by Johnson. And we'll talk about that later. Anyway, our first subtopic under the topic of the presidency of John F. Kennedy, Part 3, Civil Rights, was the Civil Rights Movement in America. And this was a very troublesome topic for President Kennedy during his administration. Okay? Very troublesome. He didn't have a lot of great success. He had more things that came about, which we'll tell you about, that gave us a black eye towards civil rights than he ever had any successes. I think he would have been a very good civil rights president, but again, didn't have an opportunity to become one. Now, civil rights really began in 1954. And civil rights is a movement to try to get equal rights for all people, correct? Well, it never really was an issue too much in the United States or got a lot of attention until 1954. Does anybody have any idea, this may be in the back of their mind on a guess, what the United States Supreme Court declared that year that made civil rights an issue? Brown versus Board of Education. And what is, shh, this is great, what is Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas? It was making it so that you couldn't segregate in schools. Very good, perfect. School segregation was ruled unconstitutional in 1954. Before that, they had schools where black kids went and schools that white kids went. Now, I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm just being uh, realistic. I want you to think about this. My wife, Worland High School graduate, 1976, tells me of when she was in elementary school in Worland, Wyoming, there was a school that who went to? Hispanic kids went to. There were principals in the district that would not let special ed or Hispanic kids in their school. And anybody know where that school was? It was a Hispanic school? It was the, highway. It was by, uh, the, high, the old highway, highway department on the other side of the uh, 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 Conoco, right, right down there. Slumberjay. Yeah, that, right next to Slumberjay. That, honest to God, was the Hispanic, and they didn't call it Hispanic oh. school in those days. So we're not that far away from this even in Worland, Wyoming. So anyway, when when... The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1954 that schools would become desegregated. That's when civil rights, as we know it, the civil rights movement in America started because people started to fight for those rights. Okay? Now, President Kennedy, when he took office, strongly believed the federal government should pass, law, should pass laws to guarantee equal rights for Negroes. He was very much for that. He did not like the fact that Negroes were being discriminated against. Now, he was in a small minority because was that the consensus of most white people this time in history in 1960? No, no that was not. Civil rights was also a major campaign issue during the campaign of 1960. We didn't talk much about it when we talked about the election because I wanted to save it. But Kennedy openly criticized the Eisenhower administration during the campaign of 1960 for not doing enough in civil rights. Eisenhower had a stand patism attitude about civil rights when he was president those eight years. He didn't do anything to help civil rights. He didn't do anything really to antagonize civil rights. He just stood pat. He did. He kind of ignored the issue. And so Kennedy jumped Nixon many times during the campaign in 1960 about his record as vice president under Eisenhower on civil rights. So it was a campaign issue, and that's why Kennedy received all the Negro vote in that election of 1960, or a vast majority of it. Now, there is some comparison to Obama, President Obama, and what he's done to become elected president in the last couple of years, really heavily reliant on the minority vote. 
So although we've come a long way in civil rights from 1954 to 2013, we do have a ways to go, and we have a long ways to go in the state of Wyoming, just so you know. There's still some things we got to figure out, okay? Now, early in Kennedy's presidential administration, he did three things right away to improve the civil rights issue when he became president. Three things that he did. So early in his presidential administration, President Kennedy did three things to improve the civil rights issue. And I just want to tell you the three things he did were about the only positive thing he could get across because he was so bombarded with negative things that happened, which we'll tell you about here in this lecture. But he did try to get this taken care of. Number one, he established the Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity, which is on your ID sheet. He created and established the Committee on Equal Oper excuse me, Equal Employment Opportunity. It was better known as the CEEO. So he established the Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity, or CEEO. Pretty self-explanatory, but what did that committee ensure? Anybody want to guess? By listening to the title, Bobby? Uh, equal Employment Opportunity. Or, okay, or Equal black. Employment Opportunities for who? For, my, for everybody. Minorities, very good. D yeah. So, and now listen, so listen, so they did not want to see discrimination to any person, no matter of their race. Now, what could Kennedy control with the CEO? Only jobs that were funded by what? Government. Federal government. So the CEO was an organization that made sure that companies that were paid by the federal government gave every person, no matter their race, an equal opportunity for employment. The post office would be an example. Our government shutdown, if you're listening to all the things that are shut down, would be a good example. Anything in which a company was paid with federal dollars had to make sure they gave every person, no matter their race, an equal opportunity. Mr. Burke, yeah. if the post office, is it shut down? I don't think the post office is shut down, but it's, but it's a place where federal government pays the employees. It's just oh, parts and stuff that are shut down. Right. Well, there's a lot, we'll talk, we're talking about there's some things that shut down that's caused a lot of controversy also. I'm just glad we are not in Washington, D.C. this week after raising all of our money. Anyway, second thing Kennedy did. Shh. Second thing he did is he directed Bobby Kennedy at the Justice Department. Remember, Bobby Kennedy is the Attorney General. He directed Bobby Kennedy at the Justice Department to support the efforts of blacks to vote. He directed his brother Bobby <laughs> at the Justice Department to support the efforts of blacks to vote. Think about that. He directed Robert Kennedy at the Justice Department to support the efforts of blacks to vote. You might be thinking in your mind, well, what do you mean? Blacks would not go to the polls at this time. Why wouldn't they? Beat up. Harassed, beat up, etc. So he asked his brother to find better ways to make black people more comfortable to go to the polls. And we'll talk about that. Especially where in the country was this bad? South. South. Deep South. The Deep okay. South. So he directed Robert Kennedy at the Justice Department to support the efforts of blacks to vote in the Deep South. Three. Third thing he did is he made key appointments in his administration. He appointed black people, or Negroes, as they were better known at the time, to positions in his administration. And I'm going to give you three examples of that. Okay? He appointed black people into his administration. Cabinet positions, minor cabinet positions, different things. I'll give you three examples of that. And these three names are all on your ID sheet. One probably familiar, hopefully. Number one. Pay attention here, it's not that tough. He made key appointments in his administration. One, he appointed Carl Rowan, who's on your sheet, U.S. Ambassador to Finland. And he obviously became the first black person ever to serve as an ambassador to any country. Carl Rowan became U.S. Ambassador to Finland. Carl Rowan. Did he have, hmm? Did he have a relation there? No, like what kind of relationship? Does the US have a well, good, it, he makes kind of a good point. Maybe not as much, but 
Yeah, the second appointment he made is he assigned or appointed Andrew Hacker to be the associate press secretary to the president. Andrew Hacker became associate press secretary to the president. Who is the press secretary? Salinger. Pierre Salinger. He became basically, in essence, Pierre Salinger's assistant. Okay? Andrew Hacker became associate press secretary to the president. The name that probably might be more familiar to you is he appointed a fellow by the name of Thurgood Marshall to the U.S. Court of Appeals as a judge. He appointed Thurgood Marshall to the U.S. Court of Appeals as a judge. Anybody know what the U.S. Court of Appeals is? Yes. It's a place you appeal to if you don't like a state decision. You can appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals. And finally, when you get done getting ripped off in your mind and you appeal all the way to what? What's your final appeal? The to the Supreme Court. Well, the ironic thing about this appointment of Thurgood Marshall, who became the first black person ever to be a judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals, he also later became the first black person ever to serve on the Supreme Court as well. So it was a good appointment. So that's what John Kennedy did to try and, and make up for some of the problems of civil rights. But this will kind of take us right into our second subtopic, which is an important one. It's called Early Struggles in the Civil Rights Movement. And I'm going to give you six examples of the struggles that not only the Civil Rights Movement had in the early 1960s, but also the struggles President Kennedy had and the things he had to deal with concerning civil rights that bothered him tremendously that he, again, never had an opportunity to fix because of his assassination. So during the Kennedy presidency, I'm going to give you, excuse me, not six, seven major events that happened during the early Kennedy administration that really gave the United States kind of a black eye concerning civil rights. Okay? So again, during the Kennedy presidency, seven major events happened in the United States concerning the civil rights issue. And I'm going to give you all seven. And this is going to make up a, a brunt of our entire test material here. Okay? These seven are it. Okay? Number one occurred in 1961 and, and it involved a group called the Freedom Riders. Freedom Riders. 1961, the Freedom Riders. Now, it's pretty self-explanatory. Freedom Riders were both black and white members of the Civil Rights Movement who were going to ride buses to protest early Jim Crow laws and call for a change in those laws. And Jim Crow laws is on your sheet. So again, Freedom Riders consisted of both black and white members of the Civil Rights Movement. Their goal was to ride buses and protest peacefully Jim Crow laws and call for a change in those laws. Jim Crow laws. Members of what? What? Members of what? Members of the, the Freedom Riders were black and white people who were members of the Civil Rights Movement. Now, some people think that the Civil Rights Movement was all black people. It was not. It was about 25 to 30 percent white people that volunteered for that who didn't feel that Negroes are be given be given the rights. Anybody heard of Jim Crow laws before? Give me anybody. Give me an example. Shh, Kylie. Uh, Shh. Uh, like, okay. I'm going to give you three examples. See so if you can give me one. Yeah. yeah. Very good. They had drinking fountains. Unbelievably so. They had drinking fountains in bus stations that told whites to drink at one fountain and colored to drink at another. This, is, this comes from 19, I got a couple of these, 14th of July, 1931 in Montgomery, Alabama. This hung in a bus station and it had two different uh, drinking fountains, one for white people and one for colored. This is an original. Yes. You know where I found this? Nope, I found this in an antique store in Virginia City, Nevada when I was visiting my son. Now this one, this is, this is old and never has been redone. How about this? September 1932 in Atlanta, Georgia. Colored entrance only. These are the real thing. They had these hanging, and if you were black, you went into 
a different entrance than whites. Why, why did they have it like that? Did they think it's hard to fathom, isn't it? But let me make a point here. So, so some examples of Jim Crow laws were Negroes were forced by law to use separate restrooms, drinking fountains, and entrances than white people. They were forced by law to use separate restrooms, drinking fountains, and entrances. Segregation folks, was legal by law in these states in the Deep South. That was law. How about another example, Kylie? That was very good. How about another example of a Jim Crow law that has to do with what she said? Have you ever watched Back to the Future? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What happened there? What happened if you went, when, when McFly went back in the future and they were in the restaurant? Oh. different restaurants they have to that's a public establishment such as hotels and restaurants banned Negroes. Banned them. Couldn't go in. Wouldn't serve them. Perfect example. Anybody heard of the Green Bay Packers of the 60s and the legendary Vince Lombardi? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they, Vince Lombardi was the coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. Very famous. The Super Bowl trophy is now called the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Many times they tell the story. I read this in a book called Instant Replay by Jerry Kramer. He was a guard that played for the Packers. It's a great book. And he gave a diary of the season. And he talked about the time they went in to play in the Deep South. And, and uh, Vince Lombardi left the players on the bus. And he went into a restaurant. And he says, do you serve Negroes here? And the guy said, we sure do. How would you like them cooked? Seriously, that was his, that was his philosophy. So it was very, very difficult for pro athletes, college athletes, and their coaches to actually get a, find a place for their people to eat. Have you seen that really, um, like when they first started letting people, um, like in the NBA? I've seen, yeah, yeah. Well, there's all kinds of Glory Road. Yeah. Now, listen to this one. Here's another one. You're going to hear about Ernie Davis. Ernie Davis was a black running back for Syracuse University. Called the Express. After they won the national championship and he was named MVP of the game, the place in which they were going to give the award to that person banned blacks. He couldn't even go to his own banquet to receive his own Most Valuable Player Award because the country club in which they were going to present it did not allow blacks and so the whole team boycott. You'll get a chance to see that. All right, how about one more, and I'll give you the hint of Rosa Parks. Black people were forced to either sit at the back of the bus or stand when a white person came in to make their seat available. So they either had to sit in the back of the bus for coloreds only, or if they were sitting in a seat up front and a white person came in, they were expected to stand and give their seat to that white person. Those are three examples of Jim Crow laws, and I want to make sure you have them. There's no question they'll be on the test. One, Negroes were forced by law to use separate restrooms, drinking fountains, and entrances than white people. Published estab number two, published establishments such as hotels and restaurants banned Negroes. And number three, black people were forced to sit at the back of the bus. Oh, D.C. Oh, Hang on. <laughs> Hello? 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 Yes. Oh, good. Hey, this is the guy from the Washington Capitals. I'm standing in class. And I just told him about our big game. No, I actually, here's the deal. I filled out the form, faxed it, and Another guy called me and we purchased the tickets today. I can't remember his name. Pete, does that make sense? <laughs> Pete, yeah, I talked to Pete and he got us all lined out. So we're good to go. Yeah, thanks for calling. Okay, see it wasn't lying. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Yes, Bodie. Where are You set me up. Do you really have a question? Yeah. Okay, if he has a legitimate question, I lost. Otherwise, I got set up. Yes. Uh, what are the, the black people who go 
go. Restaurants. Okay. <laughs> they couldn't go in hotels and restaurants. Armstrong, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> okay, moving on. What was the bet? Donuts? Yeah. Okay. I'll, be on, I'll be all over that. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Well, as I mentioned before, the Freedom Riders' plan was to ride buses to protest these Jim Crow laws. Now, their first, what happened in 1961 with the Freedom Riders is their intention was to ride Greyhound buses from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. And the purpose of the ride was to protest segregation in bus stations. So let me repeat that again. Make sure you get that down. The Freedom Riders' intention in 1961 was to ride Greyhound buses from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. And the reason they were doing it was to protest segregation in bus stations. Well, then he can tell you. Again, their intention were to ride Greyhound buses from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama to protest segregation in bus stations. What do I mean by segregation in bus stations? Drinking fountains that were separate. Having to use the uh, back entrance, using a different restroom. Those types of things. They were protesting that. Now, listen to this. Despite being backed by recent federal rulings that it was unconstitutional to, to desegregate, excuse me, it was unconstitutional to segregate bus riders. Let me start over here. <laughs> Despite being backed by recent federal law that it was unconstitutional to segregate black people, these freedom riders, you think it, you know, it's against the law, to segregate a little bit of this, right? They're still meeting resistance. Now, they get on the bus in Birmingham, and before they even get going, they're beaten and harassed by people that don't think they should make this trip. So despite that violence toward them, they still promised to carry on their peaceful protest in Montgomery. So some were beaten and harassed before they ever left, Act left with welts on their eyes, cuts on their eyes, etc. Now, I want you to think about this. What would be the biggest difficulty? That's why we don't have food in here, Bodie. Now I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to do it all the time now, sorry, lost. <laughs> anyway, what would be the biggest issue? What, would they might have, what might they have a hard time finding in Birmingham, Alabama, after especially how this has started? A bus driver. <laughs> a bus driver. Who's going to want to drive the bus? So the big deal was trying to locate bus drivers that would take these two buses from Montgomery to Birmingham. Well, it got so bad, guess who had to call the Greyhound Bus Company personally to get them to get bus drivers? Which one? Bobby. Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General, was forced to call the Greyhound Bus Company personally to ensure the company would provide drivers for the Freedom Riders because it was, their, it was their right by law to have transportation. So they couldn't find drivers, couldn't find drivers who would want to do it. Finally, Bobby Kennedy has to call the Greyhound Bus Company and force them to provide drivers. Now, once the drivers were secured, what else do you think Bobby Kennedy wanted? Escort. Well, not really. Good, good guess. He's back in D.C. in his office. What's he want? He wants to make sure that they're not going to get hurt. Or... How's he going to, and how's he going to figure that, how's he going to know? Maybe. He's going to have to send somebody to give him a report. Well, he sends John Siegenthaler, who is on your ID sheet. So after the bus driver is secured, Kennedy sends one of his aides, John Siegenthaler, a member of his staff, to travel to Montgomery in a private car, he didn't get on the bus, to observe the Freedom Riders and report back to him. And they did have the technology at the time where he could speak on kind of a CB, so to speak, back to the White House. And Kennedy had a little speaker in his office that he was listening to this whole thing. So again, once, a driver, once the driver were secured for the buses, Kennedy directed John Siegenthaler, a member of his staff, to travel to Montgomery to observe the Freedom Riders and report back to him. This is Bobby, Kennedy. This is Bobby. yep. 
<clears throat> so they get on the bus, they throw fire bombs at the bus as it leaves town from Birmingham, and when they get into Montgomery, Alabama, they get off the bus and they're greeted by a mob. And this mob beat these people with bats, clubs, kicked them, punched them, just assaulted them like you couldn't believe. So when they got off the bus in Montgomery, they were greeted by a big mob and these people, civil rights workers, volunteers, were assaulted. They were beaten with bats, they were beaten with clubs, they were kicked, punched. And Siegenthaler sat there and watched the whole thing and reported it back to Bobby Kennedy to the point where he couldn't take it anymore, so he got out of his car to try to provide assistance to these people that were getting beat. And what happened to him? They beat the hell out of him, too. And Bobby Kennedy heard all of this on this little speaker in his office coming from Siegenthaler. And he was furious. He was furious. You know why? Because police officers and FBI agents that were sent by J. Edgar Hoover to observe stood and did nothing while these people were being beat. Police officers just stood there and the FBI guys were just taking notes. And Siegenthaler, a member of the Justice Department, was getting the hell beat out of him. So Kennedy called J. Edgar Hoover, they did not get along at all, and asked him very angrily for an explanation of why a member of the Justice Department was beaten and nobody lifted a finger to help him or these civil rights workers. Now, I'm going to show you an excerpt if you'd like to see it. I think you'll enjoy it. I think you see it fine from right where you're at. This comes from a mini-series called Robert Kennedy and His Times. Very good mini-series. Arthur Schlesinger wrote a two-volume book called Robert Kennedy and His Times, and it talks about Robert Kennedy's life. But this shows basically an explanation of what happened. VCR, look out. Let's see. Now again, guys and gals, this is not real footage. It's kind of like 13 days. It's a movie, but you'll be able to figure things out pretty quickly. Okay, pay attention here if you would. Are you ready to accept that? Accepting that responsibility is part of my job. That's his father talking about this. In spite of assurances from the governor that Alabama can keep peace without federal marshals, angry crowds still line the streets outside the Birmingham bus terminal. I've got Mr. Cruitt on the phone. This is Bobby Kennedy here. Do you know how to drive a bus? Well, surely, Mr. Pruitt, somebody in the damn bus company can drive a bus. I suggest that you get on the phone with Mr. Greyhound or whoever and give us an answer. Under the law, those people are entitled to transportation provided by Greyhound. So somebody better get to that damn bus and get it going, or the government of the United States is going to be very upset. This is him getting on the bus in Birmingham.
office. Where the hell is he? You just tell Mr. Hoover. I want him in my office in the morning as soon as he comes in. I want him to explain why FBI men stood by while a Justice Department official was beaten. Well, let me speak to someone who can tell me about his condition. Okay. That gives you a little bit of an idea. Is this doctor available? Yes. A little idea what they went through. A little bit dramatic. Go ahead and turn the lights on. Yeah, Zach? Oh, could they not fight back? Well, they, not very easily. I mean, they could have, but I mean, they right away when you get hit with bats, it's pretty, it's pretty quick. Bats. But we'll talk more about this fellow divorce. Okay, now here's my point. So, I've given you one of seven things. Did this give the Kennedy administration a very positive outlook on civil rights? No. And there are many more to come. We'll move on to number two, which is 1962, the University of Mississippi. Nineteen sixty two, the University of Mississippi. <laughs> okay, on September twentieth, nineteen sixty two. James Meredith, a black military veteran was denied admission at the University of Mississippi. On September 20th, 1962, James Meredith, a black military veteran, was denied admission at the University of Mississippi. Now to give you a little bit of an idea about Meredith, he joined the Air Force right after high school and he served his country from 1951 to 1960. Nine years he served his country, but they denied him admission to go get a higher education at the University of Mississippi. He actually went to Jackson State College for two years before transferring. Anything, anybody know anything about Jackson State? Who's one of the more famous alumni there, do you know? Walter Payton? Walter Payton. Ever heard of Walter Payton? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, what's Jackson State at that time? All black college. Now, getting back to what Caitlin said, I thought in 1954 the Supreme Court said that it was unconstitutional to segregate public schools. What kind of schools were they talking about? Public schools. Talking about elementary, junior highs, and high schools. It was still legal to segregate colleges and universities. So, after his finishing his studies at Jackson State College for two years, he wished to enroll at the University of Mississippi. Now this is how crazy it was. Meredith was personally prevented from registering for classes by Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett. He personally prevented him from registering for classes because in his mind, the law stated that segregation was legal in the state of Mississippi at the college level. So Meredith was personally prevented from registering for classes at the University of Mississippi by Governor Ross Barnett. It got so bad that only after the Kennedy administration pressured Barnett did he allow Meredith to enroll. So only after the Kennedy administration stepped in and forced Barnett to do so did he let Meredith enroll? Now, how do you think that went over? Good. In segregational Mississippi. It led to riots, violent riots. And I'm going to give you three examples of what those riots resulted in. So the admission of one black Air Force veteran who served his country for nine years led to riots which resulted in two people dead 48 soldiers injured, and 30 U.S. Marshals that suffered gunshot wounds. Left two people dead, 48 soldiers injured, and 30 United States Marshals that suffered gunshot wounds of some kind. Which means what happened in order for that 
to happen, what happened? What did Kennedy have to do to restore order? Sent in federal troops. Okay? Sent in the National Guard to restore order. He sent in 5,000 federal National Guardsmen in to restore order. And local police. And as a result of that, two people were killed, 48 National Guardsmen were injured, and 30 United States Marshals were shot. Did Meredith have to leave college at the University of Mississippi? No. How did he get, how did he get from one class to another? He was escorted by federal troops to class. Escorted. Now, was that a positive thing for the Kennedy administration early? Not at all. So there's two things out of seven that happened early in Kennedy's administration that really gave us a black eye in civil rights. And John Kennedy was doing everything he could to try to restore order. Can you imagine sending 5,000 federal troops in to protect one black Air Force veteran from going to college? How long did Meredith go to Mississippi? All the way through? So Finished. They protected him the entire time. Well, we'll talk more about that because it gets a little better. Okay? Any questions? Okay, tomorrow we'll start with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference versus Birmingham, Alabama. We'll have another issue there. We will record this for you girls that will be gone tomorrow to your trip. Okay, any questions? Mr. McGee, I'll...